for people who uh, uh, may not know me, my name is Jeff Kinehart. I'm a horticulturist with the Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. I work at an ag experiment station called the Dixon Springs Ag Center, which is 30 miles north of Paducah, Kentucky, or 30 miles south of Harrisburg, Illinois. I'm sure you saw the Harrisburg in the news a couple of weeks ago with the tornadoes they had there. Um, I work principally, uh, although my degree was in ornamental horticulture, professionally I've worked 22 years uh, in the area of fruit and vegetable production, and I'm here today to visit with you a little bit about companion planting. And I guess before we, we start this, and again, this is only the third time I've ever taught in this format, and so it's kind of new to me. Um, so we'll start with kind of an overview, um, and, and basically this slide is telling you what are the things that we're going to talk about during the course of the next hour, and, and basically we will kind of give a brief definition of what is companion planting. We will talk about some of the unique things that plants do that make companion planting worthwhile to think about, and in fact, in some cases, um, something very worthwhile and desirable to do. Part of companion planting also involves uh, things such as cover crops, and so we will spend a fair amount of time talking about how to select cover crops. We will talk about um, what conditions can be enhanced for improved growth by using companion planting, uh, reducing pest damage and improving soil fertility situations with companion planting. And it ends with uh, some practical examples uh, that can be found in any number of places on the internet, as well as some, uh, some additional resources, some of the places on the internet where you could go and find uh, where some of these examples have been peeled out of. So if we can go to the next slide, if you please. You should have a picture of a vegetable garden there. And for those of you that are backyard gardeners, you know, this is a pretty typical setting. In all honesty, whether we intend to or not, I think most gardens are set up in a companion planting situation where we do have plants of different species planted in close proximity to one another. And so, you know, maybe the way we lay out the garden, we could lay it out such as to uh, get some of the benefits associated with companion planting and, and avoid some of the problems that, that might occur. If we go to the next slide, you can see that even as we get into um, what historically has been called truck patches or you know smaller commercial operations that are growing for farmers markets, even in those situations, we typically have something that's kind of expanded from the garden situation where instead of having one row of broccoli next to a row of uh, cucumbers and, and onions, instead we have four or five um, rows that are stripped, and so we have strips interplanted um, between different species. And this interplanting is kind of just, it, it's just a different form of companion planting. Next slide it talks about, you know, we should define what is companion planting, and simply enough, it's just the establishment of two or more plant species in close proximity to one another. And by choosing properly what neighbors we locate one to another, we may have some benefits of improved pest control, higher yields, we may even get some enhanced soil fertility, and on the other side of that, we could also, by choosing poorly, have increased pest problems and subsequently poor yields. Um, one of the big deals for companion planting is that, you know, it serves as sort of a, one of the strategies that can increase biodiversity and agroecosystems, and we do that via a number of different options that would include things like the use of cover cropping, interplanting, border planting, trop crops, trop, I'm sorry, trop, trap crops, there we go, I apologize, trap crops, nurse crops, and, and there are some other examples, although uh, I think this will be where we kind of confine our discussion for today. If we go to the next slide, it's just kind of a picture of some plant materials that are interplanted one with another, and I guess a cautionary tale from from this slide, when we do companion planting, 
please make sure that we select plants that are of equal vigor and, you know, we're not picking two different species that are mismatched so that one is going to outcompete the other. Um, we want to have two things that can kind of balance and complement one another rather than, you know, we're, we're looking for uh, synergistic effects as opposed to antagonistic effects. If you go to the next slide, if you look, it would appear as though we have maybe a poppy planted in amongst some uh, nasturtiums, and in here, you know, that poppy would like to have, it doesn't like to have its roots get real hot, and so the other flowers that are surrounding it are going to provide it shade. That shade is going to result in cooler root temperatures and better soil moisture relations, and that's going to uh, allow that plant to thrive. Next slide should be history of companion planting, if everybody is, are, are we on track here, Kyle? As far as I know, we are. All right. We'll talk a little bit about history of, of companion planting, and this goes back for thousands of years. One example, which is a negative one, but nonetheless, negatives and positives are both part of companion planting. Uh, walnut trees have been known for over 2,000 years to suppress the growth of other plant species. One of the classic examples, uh, walnut, and, and when we talk about walnut, we do mean all plant parts in the case of walnut, whether it be leaves or bark or roots. Um, they all contain a compound called juglone, and juglone is very toxic to other plant materials. Among the most sensitive to juglone would be tomatoes, and juglone toxicity for tomatoes has been around for a long time, and in fact, on many of the uh, plant pathology textbooks, they will have a picture of a commercial tomato field where we've got dead plants out in the field, and if you look over in the adjoining fence row right at the edge of the field, you'll see a great big walnut tree, and the Walnut trees roots are out into the field and so you wind up with a semicircular pattern of damage in the field that corresponds with uh, the root system of that walnut tree in the soil. And that picture is actually taken at a farm down here in southern Illinois um, where we have done, uh, well, we, we did tomato variety trials at that particular farm for about 30 years. It was the Cerny farm. but. Um, juglone is very problematic to tomatoes, to grapes, uh, to, to many different plant species. And so, um, although not a companion planting thing, just sort of a matter of fact thing that you need to know, you know, if you get wood chips from a truck that's, you know, out from uh, light line pole or something like that, you know, it's seldom a problem because walnuts are not commonly in a fence row, but you do need to make certain that you're not getting a load of chips that's got walnut as part of its component to what was chipped because the juglone will leach from those chips and go in and damage whatever planting it is that you are trying to dress up. So that's kind of a negative example of companion planting. A positive one, and going back to the history here, um, the Native Americans had for, for years and years and years, they talk about three sister crops, which in their case, they would grow corn, bean, and squash together, and the three of these things all provided some synergism one to another. The corn, which is a tall plant, uh, afforded a good trellis system for the bean to climb up, and so um, the bean benefited by getting higher up in the air. The squash was planted at the bases of these plantings. The squash plant, which the particular squash that they used would be more analogous or you would be more like what you would think of perhaps similar to a pumpkin, uh, but the squash plant had very large broad leaves and the squash plant's large broad leaves afforded shade and better soil moisture for the corn plant. So all three of these benefited one from being planted near the other and that was a very common system used by Native Americans. Other examples of, of companion planting and history, chemicals in oak leaves can result in the retardation of the growth of certain insects that feed on them. 
Another example are insecticides derived from plants, and the most common example here is the chrysanthemum coxanthemum, the pyrethrum daisy. Um, there's an insecticide, a naturally occurring insecticide called pyrethrum, and pyrethrum uh, is actually still used in organic, uh, by organic producers. The most common form that it would be purchased in by organic producers would be the use of a product called Pyganic, but Pyganic is an insecticide that is derived from the plant extracts that come from um, Pyrethrum daisy, which is an ornamental found in, in all of the catalogs. Lots of people grow it uh, throughout Illinois. Um, and, and, and it's a pretty, pretty decent insecticide. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk about some of the unique things that plants do. One of the things that plants do are compete for space, and they don't all compete for space in the same way. Some of them compete vertically. Some of them, uh, their growth tends to be more prostrate and low to the ground, and so they compete instead of in a vertical fashion, in a horizontal fashion. An example of that goes back to the three sisters that we talked about. The corn competed vertically. The bean then climbed up the corn. The squash, which is a very vigorous plant, the squash plant competed, but its competition was in a horizontal fashion, and each of those things benefited from uh, the way that those individual three species competed for their space. Other things that plants can do change the environment to benefit others, and I think we've given you an example of that with the squash uh, providing shade to improve uh, soil moisture and lower soil root temperatures for the for the corn crop in the example of the three sisters. Changing chemistry of the soil, I think probably most of you know that as plants grow the root system exudes hydrogen and so plant growth in and of itself typically results in the acidification of soil but some plants do a much better job of that and when we get to the section talking about um, cover crops we'll talk about buckwheat uh, and some of the things that it does, but it actually uh, has some impact on chemistry of the soil. Other things that we see is that we can influence the type of microorganisms that are in the soil, and we can can do that again through through cover cropping. Um, and and really, it should have said we can influence the type of organisms, not just microorganisms, but also macroorganism uh, fauna can be changed by. Uh, some of the cover cropping systems that we use. Other things that plants can do is suppress the growth of other plants. You know, the classic example is the juglone in the case of the black walnut, uh, which we talked about earlier. And we can have some protection from insect pests and diseases uh, from some individual plants. And again, you know, the pyrethrum daisy is seldom fed upon by insects uh, because of the fact that it has naturally occurring within it this insecticide called pyrethrum. All right, we're going to we're going to start by talking a little bit about cover cropping, and I guess um, that's probably the most common way that we use one plant species to benefit a, another plant species in modern agriculture is through the use of um, cover crops or or uh, similar things. And we'll start by saying that you know one of the things that cover crops do are it allows the uh, nutrients that are in the soil to become trapped in the plant tissue. Examples of common uh, cover crops that would be used for this would be things like buckwheat or cereal rye. And I think, you know, those of you that are interested in agriculture, you know, you've all read the articles where the nitrogen fertilizer that we put on in the Midwest, a lot of it winds up in the Gulf of the Mississippi and results in in uh, hypoxia or low oxygen, and, and it results in problems from the nitrogen pollution that occurs. One of the ways that we can reduce that, and, and bear in mind that that nitrogen pollution doesn't just come from commercial agricultural fields. It comes from places like golf courses, individuals' yards, and uh, individuals' gardens. I mean, it's, it's all of us have a, a role to play in this, but one of the ways that we can help reduce that problem is that when we're 
getting done with our garden or our commercial field in the fall of the year, we can seed it down to something like cereal rye, which will uptake lots of the nitrogen and hold it in the plant tissue. If that plant nutrient is held in the plant tissue, it is no longer subject to leaching and becoming a, a pollution problem. Instead, it's remaining in our field. The following spring, we plow the cover crop down. As the plant tissue degrades, it in turn gives back up the nitrogen to the uh, subsequent crop that we're trying to raise. And that's one example of a way that cover crops can be useful. Another example is that uh, legumes, plants that belong in the plant family Fabaceae, they include things like uh, beans, and by beans it's pretty much all types, whether it be soybean or uh, green snap bean or pole bean that you might raise in your garden, uh, and it even includes some things that you might not think of, things like locust trees, things like red buds. These are all examples of legumes. Legumes have a, a capacity to uh, well that let me let me back up let me be a little bit more accurate I apologize legumes have a symbiotic relationship with a particular bacterium and that bacterium resides in the root system and some special structures called nodules that form in legumes and that bacteria allows for the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen into forms of nitrogen that the plant can use. In case you may not be aware of this, you know, even though the Earth's atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen, that nitrogen is not in a form that is useful for any of the plants with the exception of legumes. Legumes can take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into plant usable nitrogen. So one of the things that we can do uh, is plant a leguminous crop and, and let me give you a, a horticultural example for that. In the case of strawberries that we raise on plastic in southern Illinois, we, we raise strawberries on black plastic mulch. Those strawberries are planted in the fall of the year. We would normally put on 60 pounds of nitrogen to the acre prior to establishment of that strawberry crop in the fall. But one of the strategies that we can use is to grow vetch in the summer prior to uh, prior to laying our plastic and making our beds, plow that vetch under and then come in and make our raised beds and cover them with plastic. If we do that, that vetch crop can supply almost half of the nitrogen that we need to raise the crop. Instead of applying 60 pounds of nitrogen in the fall, if we've raised a vetch crop and plowed it down prior to establishment, we will actually reduce the amount of nitrogen we put on to 30 pounds put on in the fall. So that's a you know, it's, it's a, it can be a fairly significant component of the total nitrogen requirement for the crop. You know, typically we think about 30 pounds to the acre for most legumes is what we can bank on for uh, how much nitrogen they can supply when we plow them down and, and basically wind up using that fodder as fertilizer material. Um, other things on cover crops, if you look, the last uh, bullet point in this, we've already talked about this, is scavenging leftover nitrogen, and it's really not just nitrogen, it's potassium and phosphorus and some other things, although nitrogen is the one that we have the greatest concern about leaching into the um, waterways in, in, in the U.S., um, but we can scavenge lots of different plant nutrients by uh, raising a cover crop in the fall uh, and then plowing it under. Okay, next slide is selecting cover crops. Uh, one of the things we can do is select a cover crop that produces chemicals that suppress growth of other plants. The classic example of this is cereal rye, and it's good for weed control. And if you look up no-till tomato production, what you will find is a recommendation, um, and we actually have growers in southern Illinois that have moved from just, it kind of started with tomatoes, but we've also done some work looking at it with uh, squash and some other cucurbits, but if we grow a cereal rye crop and then in the spring of the year come in with a roller and just roll the cereal rye down just as it's starting to head, that rolling will actually result in the, the rye basically succumbing and, and dying, 
and after it has died, it releases some compounds into the soil that have very good herbicide effect. And so you can come in, roll this rye down, no-till into the rolled down rye, and not have to supply a subsequent herbicide and instead get herbicidal effect from the cover crop that we have rolled down. And, and it, it does really work quite well. Um, other things that were useful for cover crop, something that was around a lot, it, you know, the 1900s, it was common practice. Uh, we kind of have gotten away from it, but we have once again started talking a lot about selecting cover crops to do some of the tillage work for us. For years and years and years, it was a common practice that you would include uh, something like sweet clover, which has a very deep tap root as part of your rotation. Uh, when we had three and four and five year crop rotations, and nowadays we spend a lot of time talking about things like tillage radishes. Um, these are radishes that get to be, I don't know, not quite as you know, not quite as big as a man's calf, but but quite large in size, and they get uh, maybe two and a half, three foot long, and so they do a nice job of penetrating plow pans or fragipan layers where we have them, and once we get that fragipan layer broke up, then we have improved soil drainage and we have enhanced conditions for plant growth. And I don't I don't know has has any of the people out there. Uh, seeing these tillage radishes or not, but they're really they're quite unique creatures. Uh, when you when you see one of them, they're quite large, and their quite large size only results in one problem, in my best estimation, and that is in the spring of the year, once these things start to rot, uh, it, it definitely produces an odor. Um, that I guess the best way to say it, it, it produces a very memorable odor. Uh, once you smell the field of these, it's starting to rot before you've got the plow in and got everything worked for the spring of the year. Um, certainly, once you smelled it the first time, you'll never forget the odor associated with it. it, it it's really not very pleasant, to be honest about it. Okay. Could I ask a question? Yes. A question about the rye. How does sure. it um, help the get the rid of the weeds without hurting the crop that you're planting? Because the herbicide is in low enough concentration that it works on very small um, seedlings. But I talked about when, when I said no-till, in the case of the squash and in the case of the tomatoes, we are putting transplants into the field. And so we've already got plants that are at the three, four, or five leaf stage. The concentration of the chemicals is such that it doesn't cause harm to uh, the larger plants, but they are in sufficient concentration to result in seedlings that are just starting to emerge to succumbing to the chemicals in question. If Thank that you. makes sense. Yeah, sure. No problem. Any other questions? I wish it was smell of vision and I had some, some of these... Uh, uh, tillage radishes because you'd all get a lesson. You would you would have a memorable afternoon. Um, anyway, uh, they smell bad. Um, if you click the slide one more time, there'll be a picture pop up where it just shows some cover crop that has been established um, into soybean stubble. And you know, this was a standard practice for years and years and years kind of got away from it, but it is becoming more and more popular, particularly in the southern end of the state where we tend to have much more sloping ground. We have much less organic matter, and so we probably get um, more benefit from cover cropping than anywhere else in the state, although I think there are benefits to be gotten from cover crops no matter where you are in the state. We just probably differentially get a little more bang for our buck down here. Jeff, that um, tillage radish, at least through, you know, the western part of the state, all I can speak towards is, is becoming more popular. So uh, no, think, a lot of I producers are doing Yeah, no, I think it absolutely is becoming more more popular. And, and, again, I think if you go back and look at old crop production rotations where uh, you would have a, a cornfield and then that might well turn into a hay field for a year or two, 
and then to a bean field, followed back to a cornfield. So we were on a four or five year rotation. Those two years where we had that piece of field in um, pasture or hay production, it was very common to do some of the deep uh, tap-rooted legumes uh, to serve much the same purpose as what we're using the tillage radish for, and that is to get something that had uh, a pretty significant tap root to it that would get down through this fragipan, typically located, you know, six or eight inches below, or the plow layer located six or eight inches below the earth's surface, and you know this goes below that, and basically it gets large in size that it, that it has a pretty good shattering effect on the fragipan layer. But I absolutely agree that uh, that practice is increasing um, is the current trend for it. Okay, next should be a slide that says enhanced conditions for growth, and we'll talk about some cover cropping, and I'm sorry, I apologize, um, some companion planting things that we can do to enhance conditions for growth. One of the things that you would do, and, and I think those of you that are master gardeners, I think I would I would guess uh, that you have read the Vegetable Gardening for Illinois book that was originally written by Corder or Vandemark. I think it now carries Chuck Boyd's name on it. But if you'll look in that book, um, either in the front or back cover, one of the two, they, they, they spend some time talking about how to lay out a garden. And part of what they talk about in that how to lay out a garden is – is getting at this first point, and that is uh, one of the things we can do with companion planting is provide a um, better situation for shade-loving plants such as, you know, the, the leaf lettuces. Leaf lettuces don't have to have shade, it's just they don't like it very warm, and so they tend to do better in shady locations uh, in, in the kind of environment that we have here in Illinois. You know, if we were in a cooler environment, they might be able to well stand full sun all the time. But in Illinois, I think they're probably going to benefit from uh, afternoon shade at least um, to keep them higher, higher in quality and, and tasting better and those kinds of things. So one of the things that we might do, for example, is to keep things like the sweet corn that we're growing located to um, – either the south or to the west of where we were going to plant our lettuce. In other words, the lettuce we would set either north or east of where the corn plant was at, and thereby we'd have morning sun on the on the uh, leaf lettuce so that we still had you know, part of the day where it was getting good quality sunlight so that it makes lots of photosynthate. But during the, the heat of the day, uh, we would get some benefit from uh, the shade is that the, could be provided by the by the sweet corn plant. Um, other examples, he talks about overseeding. I guess we're we're going to skip the overseeding section. Let's go down to point three on this uh, enhancing conditions for growth. It's pretty common that between rows of perennial crops, whether that be something like apple or peach trees or uh, blueberries blackberries, raspberries, it's fairly common that we have a perennial grass crop that we grow in between those aisleways. That perennial grass crop is an example of companion planting, and it affords us several different benefits. One of them is it helps control soil erosion, and it helps control weeds. It provides a path for us to get equipment. You know, peaches and apples and, to a lesser extent, brambles. And peaches and apples are typically sprayed in a commercial setting. They're sprayed on a weekly basis with a tractor-mounted sprayer. And if we just had bare dirt in between the peach trees or the apple trees, we would have tractor that was stuck all the time. So instead, uh, the side cover strips that we have in between these aisles allow us to get our equipment in and out without it tracking up the field, without our tractor getting stuck, and all those kinds of things. And so it's very good. Now, as good people interested in horticulture and things like companion planting, I think one of the things that your mind, and you certainly wouldn't be alone, so, so did the rest of us used to think this way, one of the things that you might think is that, well, it would sure be a neat idea if we interceded in addition to that um, perennial grass crop that we have, maybe we could intercede some sort of legume 
uh, and, and that legume would help fix nitrogen and allow our grass cover crop to grow better. And that's a really neat concept, but what we wound up finding out is that stink bug, which is a pretty major pest of peaches and kind of a pest of all of the crops that we've talked about in, in terms of these, these um, fruit crops that we've been discussing just now, um, stink bug is attracted to clover flowers. And so if we were to include clover as part of what is in our mix for our um, perennial cover in the strips between rows, we wind up actually increasing our pest problems rather than decreasing them. So um, although it would be a great idea from the point of view that the uh, sod would get benefit from the nitrogen that was fixed by the legume, the clover, uh, you have a antagonistic effect on the actual crop that we're trying to raise, the one that we're going to make money off of, because we attract in additional stink bugs, which are, uh, number one, sometimes a little bit difficult to control, and number two, particularly in the case of peaches, uh, we have very few products that are labeled uh, that do a good job when it gets to be harvest time because of the pre-harvest interval that has to be observed uh, between the time we spray and the time that we pick. So anyway, that's, that's uh, another example of companion cropping the use of, of grass permanent sod walkways or pathways uh, in between rows of perennial, uh, typically perennial fruit crops uh, that we will be raising. Other examples of uh, Companion planting would be the use of nurse crops, and and I guess the most common example, I think most of the people on here are from the central part of the state, unless I'm mistaken, and with that assumption, I would say that probably the most common example of the use of a nurse crop that you would see there would be the use of oats and alfalfa being seeded together at the same time. The oats come up more quickly, and they provide protection uh, from wind and beating rains and some of those kinds of things as that alfalfa seedling is becoming established. The alfalfa seedling is a little bit slower to grow and a little bit more of a prima donna. And so the oats kind of protect it or serve as a nurse, if you will, hence the term nurse crop, uh, until the alfalfa is large enough in size and hardy enough that it kind of takes off on its own. And the beauty of that system is that the oats kind of just you know, as it gets hot, the oats die off, and, and you don't really have to do anything overly special to them, but they've served their purpose because they've allowed the alfalfa to become established. Let's go on to reducing pest damage. The next slide. Are we still together, Kyle? Yep, we're good. Okay. Reducing pest damage. Plants produce chemicals that protect them from insects and diseases, and that sentence should have read, some plants produce chemicals that protect them from insects and diseases. These chemicals may in some cases act as actual outright insect toxins, as in the case of the pyrethrum and the um, uh, pyrethrum daisy. In other cases, they may simply be feeding deterrents. They may not uh, taste good. Uh, some have fungicidal properties, and, and I guess the most common, more modern example used in horticulture Marigold roots can produce chemicals that are toxic to some nematode species. There was a lot of work done by Cornell University. Uh, I believe it was in the mid-90s uh, where they looked at nematodes can be a very significant problem on matted row strawberries. And they found that if prior to going in and planting your matted row strawberries, you would grow a crop of African marigolds and plow it down, the African marigolds would greatly greatly reduce the nematode levels in those soils and the subsequent yield of the strawberry crop that followed this, um, although not quite as good as methyl bromide fumigation, was very, very good. Uh, the, the plants were quite uh, nematicidal in their, in, in the compound that the marigolds produce is quite nematicidal and does a pretty good job of uh, cleaning up um, nematode problems that can be present on some sites. Next slide, reducing pest damage. Other examples, insect pests in some cases locate their food by smell. That's not the only way that they do it, but that is one way that they can do it. 
And some things like culinary herbs produce strong scents that may confuse insect pests from locating uh, a host. And in those cases, by carefully interplanting those kinds of very odoriferous plants in amongst uh, plants that are quite susceptible to pest damage, we may be able to reduce overall pest damage levels. Examples of these kinds of plants that are quite odoriferous would include things like onions, garlics, chives, catnip, whorehound, wormwood, basil, tansy, mints. But again, cautionary tale, things can be good, can turn bad. In the case of catnip, wormwood, and the mints, you may not, you know, you may be able to interplant those and deter your insect pests, but you may find that those plants are so aggressive that they outgrow whatever crop it was that you were trying to protect. And so you didn't lose anything to the insect pest, but then you didn't have any crop to harvest either because of the aggressive nature of uh, the mints that you planted. Next slide, reducing pest damage. Specific food preferences for some insect pests exist, while in other cases, uh, insects may be um, capable of feeding on a wide range of, of things. Preferred hosts can be planted as a trap crop near plants to help protect uh, the crop that we're trying to raise and pest kill before moving into the desired crop. The use of trap cropping is, again, something else that has become in, in increasingly common, and it works in a couple of different ways. One thing, you know, if we're worried about aphids, then we grow a plant that is very, very attractive to aphids. One thing that has been used commercially a lot is the use of sunflowers, for example, near pepper fields. Aphids harbor viruses, and, and in the case of peppers, one particular virus is cucumber mosaic virus, and basically aphids transmit that virus into the pepper plant. By planting sunflowers around our pepper field, most of the aphids will wind up, or a high percentage of the aphids will wind up landing in the sunflowers prior to coming into our pepper field. And typically, once they land there, they will feed one time. And in that one feeding, it winds up, in the case of cucumber mosaic virus, in actually cleaning the virus from their proboscis or their snout. And so then, even if they come into the field and feed on the pepper, which is still bad, we don't like aphids feeding on the pepper, but because they got their snout cleaned out in the trap crop of the sunflowers, we do not have the virus problems that we would have had had that aphid just fallen in the first place that he fed was on a pepper plant. So that's a, that's a good thing, and an example of how we can use a trap crop. In other cases, we may plant a trap crop that is um, very attractive to a pest, and we may treat that crop very heavily with insecticides, but that allows us to reduce, greatly reduce, the amount of insecticide that we actually use on the crop that we are raising uh, for consumption or, or for commercial production. And so that can be uh, another good thing. Some examples, geraniums are very attractive to cabbage worms. And so you can plant geraniums near cabbage and we would hope that uh, you could reduce the amount of cabbage worm damage that you would see on the cabbage that you're trying to raise. And that would come at the expense of having lots of cabbage worm damage on the geraniums. Um, there are other examples. Okay, next slide is again reducing pest damage, attracting beneficial insects by planting flowers near the garden. Uh, examples, beneficial insects such as predatory wasps, flies, um, ladybugs. Uh, by selecting the flowers that we plant around the garden, we can enhance or increase the number of those things that exist. Uh, examples of plants that are likely going to attract those sorts of insects would include things like dill, parsley, carrot, coriander, and parsnip. Another example um, that I think is becoming or is probably used more commonly commercially is that we may attract plants, uh, we may plant plants um, in a companion setting, either in strips or uh, at the edge of the field to attract pollinators. Um, anything that we can do to get the bees to come near our crop uh, is behooves us. One of the common examples that we see now, you know, there are some people that are um, planting 
planning a strip just outside of their high tunnel to attract in bees in the hopes that once the bees are there working that planting that they've made outside of the high tunnel, some of them will wind up just by happenstance meandering into the tunnel and help take care of some of the pollination requirements that we have for the crops that we're raising inside of the tunnel. So there's a couple of examples of how, you know, companion planting some other species with the desired crop, um, you know, may enhance our pollination. Uh, or it may allow us to reduce insect pest problems. Next slide, the use of companion planting to impact soil fertility. We've already talked about legumes for nitrogen fixation and, and what a good job they can do. Another example, if you'll look, the second bullet point is the accumulation of phosphorus and potassium. And we said earlier, um, buckwheat is something that does a really good job. It actually takes phosphorus, this goes back to sort of the chemistry, if you will, takes some of the phosphorus that is in the soil that is in forms that are not readily plant available, things like rock phosphate, and wind up uh, degrading that rock phosphate into other compounds that in fact are readily plant available. And so uh, buckwheat can change the uh, soil chemistry and result in enhanced fertility for the crops that we're trying to raise the last on the list is the use of green manure crops. Green manure crops typically are leguminous, but not always. Uh, and green manure crops are going to be something that we grow up to five, six, seven inches in size and then plow it down way ahead of it becoming mature. And the reason that we plow it down early is that uh, it doesn't take near as long to break down if we do it that way as opposed to letting the plants become mature. and um, it helps increase soil organic matter. Again, in central Illinois, where you have four or five percent organic matter or even higher, probably not near as big a deal as it is for in the southern end of the state, we have soils that are somewhere between, you know, one half percent organic matter to maybe one, one and a quarter percent organic matter. And we actually can get some pretty good benefit by uh, plowing down green manure crops prior to. Um, establishing a crop for commerce or a commercial crop. Any questions to this point? Okay. We're, we're about done. I mean, I think there's, and we're about out of time too, I think, is looking at this. So there's the, from, from here on, I think there's a pretty big list of some examples and, and basically Maurice went and pulled these examples from there's lots of different sources out there for what plants go good and what plants don't go good. And I don't know that we're even going to go through all of those. I think all of you have access to the slide set. Is that correct, Kyle? Yeah. Okay. So you guys can go back and look at those specific examples if you would like. Or, again, they're available from a, from a number of different sources. But when we think about practical examples, what goes good with what, you know, there's lots of places to get information. Some of that information has some scientific basis for it. Some of it, quite honestly, doesn't have much scientific basis for it. One of the things that you may want to do is to operate small trials to see, you know, what kinds of things do you actually find work well in your own particular um, commercial operation or your own particular uh, garden setting. So with that, let's go to... Uh, and again, I do not want to, I don't think, go through this entire list of these, um, but, but let's start with looking at the Solanaceae family. Okay, tomatoes, and what you're seeing in this slide is it says that tomatoes do well near asparagus, carrots, celery, onions, parsley, and peppers. And if we plant basil, it may deter some fly problems. If we plant borage, it may reduce hornworm injury because the hornworm would go to the borage preferentially before it would go to the tomato plant. And it says you should avoid planting it near corn, brassica dill, and Irish potatoes. The Irish potato thing is because, um, well, Irish potatoes in the end, when I gave this presentation the other night, Irish potatoes, if you look at companion planting in general, they're not really too good to go with a whole lot of things. And so um, 
one of the ladies made the comment that seemed like, well, maybe Irish potatoes should just be planted by themselves. And to some extent, I think there is some truth to that. And part of the reason for that is, you know, you're going to have to dig the potatoes and kind of make a ruckus out of the garden anyway. And so, you know, we see an increasing number of people uh, putting potatoes into uh, container situations rather than uh, growing the potatoes in the garden. They actually raise their potatoes in separate containers. Um, and, and there's some merit to that. And if you'd like, if there's time after we're done here, we can talk about why that can be a pretty good deal. Let's go back and look at just a little bit of science. Why would we not want corn and tomatoes planted together? You know, those of you that have raised tomatoes, have any of you ever managed to find a worm inside of your tomato? Yes, mm -mm. no, maybe? Mm -mm. Well, it can't happen, and it's a pretty unpleasant situation when you are got your beautiful red tomato, and if you look in the side of it, there's a great big hole where a worm has gone in. And Jeff, I just think no one will admit it. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you all are living a whole lot better life because it's a pretty common occurrence down here to have a tomato uh, that has a worm in it. And if we look, you know, the tomato fruit worm, the worm that occurs in tomatoes, is also the same as a corn earworm. They are the exact same pest. It's just if we find it in the end of an ear of corn, we call it corn earworm. If we find it inside of a tomato fruit, it's called tomato fruit worm. But it is coming from the same moth. It is the same species. So it makes pretty good sense that we wouldn't want corn planted near a tomato planting because corn is probably the premier and the most attractive thing for corn earworm moths. And so now we're going to be, instead of repelling insect pests, we're going to be attracting in a pest that uh, is going to be a potential problem on tomatoes. Let's go to the next slide. We're just going to skip. Then we're going to go to the one that says peppers. If you look, peppers, again, <clears throat> similarly to what we saw, peppers, tomatoes went with peppers. Peppers go with tomatoes, as we see here. Carrots, onions, and spinach are good choices. Um, geraniums planted nearby may help reduce some beetle and other pest problems. Um, and again, if you look, it says here to avoid corn. Well, in this particular case, peppers, if you pick them and look, also it is not uncommon to see a hole in the side of the pepper. In many cases, though, unlike the tomato, in many cases we may not actually find the worm present inside of the pepper when we open it up to clean it out and take out the seeds. In some cases we do, but more commonly we don't. We just see this hole in the size side of the fruit. That hole can also then later be an entry point for um, rainwater and the, uh, the bacteria Erwinia, which will result in bacterial soft rot and can result in pretty significant losses both commercially and in the home garden. But that hole in the side of the pepper fruit is caused by European corn borer. Again, corn being the most attractive, we would like to not have peppers and corn situated one close to the other because if we've got the pepper planting near corn, then we're going to have increased likelihood of having corn borer damage on our on our peppers and, and it can be pretty pretty significant. Um, let's see where we're at on time. I think on time we're about we're about done, but anyway, if you'll look and just sort of flip through these slides um, quickly, you can see lots of examples that are given here for things to plant near and things to not plant near. How near is near? How near is near? Uh, excellent question. <laughs> the literature is not overly concise on that. But we can get benefit from, in many cases, we're talking about things that may be 15 or 20 foot apart on a commercial setting, in fact, would be considered near. In a home garden setting, you're likely probably looking at things um, that are much closer than that. You're probably looking at 5 and 10 foot in proximity. But, you know, for example, when we talked about things like trying to attract in pollinators, if that strip for trying to attract in the pollinators is within 
15 or 20 feet of the edge of the crop that we're trying to protect, we would consider that plenty close enough and would anticipate getting some benefit from it. In regards to the ones you're supposed to avoid in the small garden, near is going to be near and, if it's in the garden? And, and, and that becomes a problem, ma'am, in all honesty, because one of the things that we talk about all the time in, in your, your question and your thought is 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 very good, and, and I guess let me give you the the I would say the good news and the bad news of the story, but I'm not sure. Maybe I just had the bad news of the story. But you know, for example, when we talk about a pest like squash bug, if you have ever raised pumpkins before, the first time you raise pumpkins or muskmelon on a virgin site, it's very very easy. You have very few disease and insect problems. But when we come back and try to raise them a second or at least by the third year, we typically see problems with squash bug and squash vine borer and lots of pest problems that we'd have when the ground was fresh. So we would think, you know, one of the best ways to deal with that is crop rotation. But to be very honest with you, like in the case of a garden, rotating it in a, you know, if we've got a garden that's 30 by 100 foot, Rotating that squash from one end of the 100-foot garden to the other end of the 100-foot garden, quite honestly, isn't going to have much impact on the pest population. We need to be rotating further away. And I think that the same thing is true on, on the um, plantings. You know, you're asking about to avoid some of the detrimental effects, how far would you have to get away? And I think the simple answer is I'm not sure that in a typical garden you're going to get far enough away However, I think that for most of these, there are other strategies that we can use uh, to still um, be successful in our gardening operations. I still think you. you can get lots of benefits from the companion plantings. Uh, again, things like uh, cover cropping or planting rows of flowers that would uh, be either odoriferous for confusing insect pests or even better yet, or I feel even more comfortable yet with attracting some things that are very um, attractive to bees, something like Monarda, uh, bee balm, if you will, uh, an herbaceous ornamental perennial uh, near the garden so that we're attracting in good guys. Uh, you know, I think that those benefits can be achieved in the garden setting. When you speak of Irish potatoes, does that mean any potato? No, it's to be con not confused with sweet potato. When we talk about potatoes, we talk about two classes. They're either Irish or sweet. Anything else for Jeff on for today's program? Back to the black walnuts. Yeah, you were talking about the black walnut that has the um, chemical that repels other plants. Yes. Isn't there another tree that repels plants like the black walnut? Is, is there another tree that repels plants like black walnut? I think there are a couple of other species that have plant root exudates or plant things, chemicals that uh, are excreted from the plant root system that will result in uh, deterring plant growth but I don't think any of them are as striking or as toxic as juglone. What is more common with most tree species, or at least many tree species, for example, if you have a red or silver maple in a landscape setting, you typically have very, very growth, but that's because a lot of the root system is up in the upper realm of the soil, and so they outcompete. They draw all the moisture and compete more effectively for moisture than what the grass species is that we're trying to raise. And so the plant growth is greatly reduced. It is very common that we don't see much growth underneath the plant trees, but that is not always a function of a specific allelopathic chemical, as is in the case of juglone. In many cases, it's because of the shade that, number one, the tree affords, and so it's got some competitive advantage because it's taking most of the sunlight, and then secondarily, uh, its root system is such that it's pretty effective at out competing most other plants that would be trying to be growing below it. I have a question on um, the companion planting also on the chemicals in the oak leaves that lead yes. to the 
retardation of growth of insects that feed on them. What mm -hmm. insects are those? Um, insect pest, probably the most common one that I'm familiar with is, uh, oh, it's a little waspy fly thing that causes oak gall, but um, in all honesty, I guess, I think part of the point is, uh, and again, Maurice put that together, but I think the simple truth of the matter is, there are not many insect pests that feed on oak leaves because of the level of um, tannins and other compounds, but particularly tannins, that exist, uh, make them almost impalatable for most other plant species. If you look, it is not overly common to see uh, insect problems on oak trees, with the exception of uh, gall problems can, can exist. Right. It's okay, thank wasp. you. Yes. Okay, Jeff, I sure want to thank you and all the all the host sites for helping with today's program. Thank you everybody.